Well, thank you for coming out. Are you all excited about your, the big market comeback? Best week of the year, last, last week. Best week for the NASDAQ was up 5.3%. Uh, the best week for the NASDAQ since January of 2013. Uh, the Dow was only up 2.5%, but the S&P was up 4%, the Russell 2000 was up 3 the world as a whole was up a little more than 2 so we're not quite back to where we were. Uh, we hit the all-time highs, you remember, in September 19th, and now we're um, about 25 3% below that, and we were 8% below, so we've come back a long way. How many of you, let me get some, how many of you heard any of our ads on the radio? What stations? WSJS. WSJS. 980. 980. Anybody hear us on 94.5? One. Okay. I said on TV. What? TV. TV? Yeah. Do we have any TV ads? Not for the seminar. Oh, not for the seminar, just for the company generally. Yeah. Yeah, people tell me they see me in that ad and I look good and I shake my head a little bit, but that's okay. Um, how many of you get our newsletter? Okay, well, uh, we write it uh, the first day or two of the quarter or as soon as we can get it out the first week of the quarter. And you can see down uh, right near the bottom in green there. If you want to get it, it's free. It's hungerford.newsletter at gmail.com and you just send a... Um, email and put subscribe in the subject line and you unfortunately uh, 980 doesn't have a very good signal but you can listen to us on the internet uh, they do stream that show on www.eagle980.com and I'm on about every three weeks or so and George our new guy George Burns and John Woodard and uh, Todd and Steve uh, we all take turns so it was a good week last week Barron's has a kind of funny statement. It says, you know, what would have happened if um, Amazon, well, Amazon did report last week, but IBM and Coke and McDonald's and some of these big blue chips that have been so disappointing, what if they had reported last week instead of the previous week? Instead, 80% of companies that reported last week, about 20% of the market beat their earnings. The average of companies beating the earnings is about 63%, and so far for the uh, third quarter, we've had 75% uh, beat earnings. And I think, I mean, when you come right down to it, it's how much money companies are making that's the most important thing to the stock market. And the stock market gets uh, off track because it looks at the, the Ebola scare, the crisis in the Middle East, uh, ISIS, uh, the Ukraine, uh, riots in Hong Kong. Uh, the weakness in, well, weakness in Europe the economy was certainly a fundamental factor. And uh, we hit our all-time high, as you see there in the first paragraph on page 2, September 19th, for both the Dow and the S&P. And then we had a nearly 8% sell-off. And the turning point was a week ago Wednesday. And uh, Steve and I rushed down to get uh, more money to mark on Thursday. Turns out once in a while you write. Uh, <laughs> Because what happened Wednesday? The market opened basically in the morning and went down 460 points. At that point, uh, the S&P 500 was down 9.5%, just a half a percent away from what's called officially a correction. How did we get to the market uh, words that a correction is 10%? Why can't you have a correction a little lower? But anyway, point is, uh, officially the market doesn't correct until it goes down 10%. Well, we never quite made that even during midday. And then the market rallied back and finished down 173. That was almost a 300-point rally from the bottom. But that very day, the Russell 2000, the small company stocks were up 1%. And Steve and I were talking about it. We said, when small companies go up, ahead of large companies, that's usually a good sign. What had happened is, from July 1st through October 10th, the Russell 2000 had gone down 15%. So the small companies did have a correction. And uh, anyway, so the market turned around and we're up about, um, 
five and a half, six percent since that market uh, bottom at the end of October 15th. Um, so since then, except for Wednesday, where I think the market was rattled a little bit by that terrorist attack, a lone terrorist turned out in Ottawa on the Canadian Parliament, uh, the S&P 500 has been up every day six out of the last seven days. So it is good news. And it's typical, so many times the market bottoms in mid-October. Somebody did a study of Octobers and said that since World War II, uh, let me get the numbers right, 44 had been up, 29 had been down, and a few of them uh, had been fair. Anyway, the market has averaged in October two-tenths of a percent gain. And October is typically a better month than September, but of course the best months coming up, which have averaged over 1% gain, you say, well, 1%, that's not very much. Well, if you make 1% a month, I'll take that, right? <laughs> November and December, historically, are the best months. And then if you go back down into that uh, f fifth paragraph, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, fifth paragraph, and I don't think it's going to happen this time, but since 1928, midterm election fourth quarters have risen 6.5%. And even more amazing is since 1948, the market has averaged 16% gains after midterm elections. Well, the S&P 500 has been up uh, seven quarters in a row. But the reason your quarterly uh, statements, your portfolio statements were so bad, most of you, I assume, are diversified. And unfortunately, last quarter was a disaster for just about everything except the S&P 500. Uh, it was up 1%. The Dow was up about 1%. But uh, as you see there in the fourth paragraph, uh, the average international fund is down 3%. Last quarter, the average international fund was down 6 And the small caps were down 8 And if you have a portfolio that's partly small, partly international, partly large, obviously you lost money last quarter. Um, Again, most of it was geopolitical. Another reason the market rallied this week was um, the great earnings report from Caterpillar, which is considered a uh, market leader for the economy, GM, Microsoft. They all had good reports this week. And uh, the reports last week from companies like IBM, Coke, and McDonald's were really lousy, and Amazon and AT&T didn't do very well. IBM, Coke, and McDonald's are really hurt by the stronger dollar. The stronger dollar is good for us consumers because it makes us, uh, uh, our dollars, uh, buy more imported goods. But it's bad for us as investors because when Europe and the foreign countries translate the money back into a stronger dollar, we don't get as many dollars. Um, so the uh, Europe, I think the biggest cause, the eight and a half percent, eight, nearly 8% eight sell off was Europe. Uh, uh, Europe's problem is that for two and a half, three years, they've been either a negative 1% growth or a positive one. And this year, they were expected to go 2% or get much stronger, and they haven't. Uh, Germany man manufacturing index was down 4% uh, in August. That hurt, certainly hurt the market. And one of the things that helped this week was the purchasing managers in Europe went from 52 to 52.2, you say. That's not much of a gain, but it was expected to go down. 50 means even. 52.2 means that the manufacturing, uh, purchasing managers index rather is growing slightly. China was 50.2 and went to 50.4. So again, uh, China has been on the edge of a slowdown. But all these things have, have come together and certainly I think where I, the bottom is in. I was quoted a week ago <laughs> today on, in the Winston-Salem Journal about uh, have we reached bottom, and I said I certainly thought so, but you never know. Uh, the un unemployment data, oh, the GDP growth, I started to say I got sidetracked for Europe, is 1% uh, probably right now, except in Great Britain, they're about 3%. They're doing much better than uh, and this, to the people who didn't want to join the Euro in Britain who fought it so much. When Tony Blair wanted to join, uh, use the euro, um, they say, see, we're right. And of course, the Scottish uh, gave a vote of confidence to the UK by uh, voting to not go independent. Uh, the, um, so the 
but Europe is growing at less than 1%, uh, Japan is growing at less than 1%, and we look terrific compared to the rest of the world. Uh, we're probably going to come in between 3 and 3.5%. Three and you say, but Dr. Hungerford, we grew 4.6% in the second quarter. And yeah, but we were negative, almost negative 3% in the first quarter. The second quarter was a bounce back from all that terrible weather uh, last winter. Um, so the unemployment numbers are terrific. Uh, we're down to 59 last month, the lowest since July 2008. And on October 7th, it was reported that job openings were 3.4% of those employed, and that's the highest in 13 years. And then the new unemployment claims uh, that were reported October 16th, week before last, came in at only 265,000, and that was the lowest in 13 years also. So the unemployment numbers are good. In fact, the, um, the four-week moving average where you take the four weekly unemployment claims and just average them out, is now the lowest since 2000. So it's uh, pretty good. And of course, these lower gas prices are sensational for the economy. For each dollar that, uh, for each 10 cents the gasoline prices go down, it puts $14 billion in consumers' pockets. And gasoline prices, as most of you know, Steve and I went to do our seminar in uh, Greensboro. For some reason, gas is cheaper in Greensboro. Yes, sir, I bought gas at. Anybody want to guess? 289. You're close, 289. I bought it for 288 yesterday. Where? Um, right there at um, Little Clemens Road and 421. Wow. I got it at 275. It cost it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can anybody top 275? <laughs> going once, going twice. You won and you get a free handout. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Anyway. Guy on CNBC said, right now oil is a little bit more than $80 a barrel. He said 80 to 85 is the wonderful sweet spot for the U.S. economy because at 80 to 85, U.S. producers can still make good profits, but it has lowered the, uh, the prices of everything else, inputs. There's a little, uh, little, it's the biggest trucking company in the United States called XPO. And uh, they bought out a, a company called New Breed. It's a logistics company. And they're responsible. They're the biggest shipper of last mile trucking. They have contracts with all these independent truckers called XPO. And um, they're the biggest shipper out of Mexico to the United States. And they're rallying. And it's just a, and the airlines are going up like crazy. So it's really good for the economy. It's good for all of us. Barron says that oil is going down to $75 a barrel. At about 75 or a little below 80, then you get some of the high price uh, U.S. production is not as profitable, or I doubt if they shut wells, but you don't get the added exploration that you're now getting. Give you an example how successful we've been. In 2011, we were producing about 10.1 million barrels a day. Now we're producing 13.4. So think about that. U.S. oil production. That's not even counting natural gas, has gone up uh, a third in three years. We have passed Russia now as the number one, number two producer of oil in the world behind Saudi Arabia. We should pass the Saudis by 2020. And speaking of the Saudis, they could have cut production, as sometimes they have done in the past, but they're still producing uh, dramatically. And the idea is that they wouldn't mind oil prices going lower because they want to shut off some of this exploration and they're no friends of Mr. Putin and this is wonderful for the Russian economy. Horrible for the Russian economy. The Russian economy depends so much on energy. Uh, they have 8% inflation in Russia now and they're growing at 8 tenths of 1%. And if oil prices go down much lower, uh, they're going into recession. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. <laughs> so. Uh, I almost hate to recommend the oil uh, since a week ago, Tuesday, uh, two weeks ago Tuesday, I've been recommending oil prices. Uh, it, it was so weird because uh, Delta, uh, American Airlines, Continental, they all dropped about 30% from their all-time high uh, by two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. You say, how in the world could airlines be going down, but oil prices would be going down because that's their major cost of input. 
Angela is the Ebola scare. And it was so ridiculous. So last week, Delta rallied 15%. It's still down about 8% from its all-time high. It's still selling at three times earnings. I still recommend it, but it's hard to recommend it as enthusiastically as I did last week at this time. And uh, so it's... Uh, three times earnings. And that's, you know, previous earnings. So the new earnings with the low oil prices will be much higher. Um, anyway, manufacturing continues to improve. We hit a high in August of 59. Uh, again, above 50 indicates growth. Uh, ADP, and this was one of the best pieces of news I've seen, and they are the payroll processing firm worldwide, and they take surveys of all their employers and they said hourly pay of private sector workers had gone up 4.5% a year over year. And uh, Uncle Sam, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, says 2%. And many people think that's what's been holding back the economy is while the corporations have been making lots of money, the workers haven't shared in it. So uh, that may have helped a little bit. So our advice is simply to hang in there. Don't give up on small stocks or international ones. Small companies have started to rally. The internationals are still way below um, Europe is down 8% for a year. I think I got that statistic over on the other page. Uh, yes. Um, yes, Europe is down uh, through October 10th. Yeah, it's the fourth paragraph from the bottom. Uh, no, that's it. Anyway, Europe is down about 8% for the year, and the average international fund is about down 3%, and what has done the best is emerging markets. Uh, emerging markets are the uh, outside of Europe, outside of Japan. Questions? Before I get Steve up here? I was supposed to do this in 15 minutes. I'm uh, two minutes over. What do you say for the fourth quarter? I mean, I guess well, generally, fourth quarter is a midterm election year. It's average 6% increases. Uh, uh, we're, we're just about back to where we were September 30th. September 30th, we were down 2%. From, from September 19th, then we went down eight, almost 8%, eight now we're back to about 2.5% down. So for all this rally we had last week, we're still probably barely negative for the month of October. Uh, I, think, I think it's going to be fine. Earnings are really good, the economy is growing, there's no question about that. The statistics come in. Uh, the Fed has stopped its quantitative easing, but it's not going to raise interest rates anytime soon. We I think Steve and I thought maybe next spring at one point, but now it may be even next summer or later. So uh, I, I think you're going to be all right. I think you can invest here. Steve and I were quoted in a paper, and when a reporter wrote me, I didn't know he was a reporter, and I just was responding like I would respond to anybody else. And I said I thought the, the uh, correction was over, and he quoted me. But I said, Steve and I rushed down to Sockery last Thursday to get as much money as we could get our hands on in the economy that we invested a week ago Friday. So we got lucky. So you don't see the election results, whatever they may be, affecting the fourth quarter that much? I don't think so, because even if the Republicans gain the Senate, you still have that stupid filibuster rule. You all know about the filibuster rule. The filibuster rule is that you can't break a filibuster in the Senate unless you get three-fifths votes. All right. The idea is, in the old days, you had to stand up. Remember, Strom Thurmond spoke for 40 straight hours at one point against civil rights. He was the uh, senator from uh, uh, South Carolina who married uh, Beauty Queen when he was in his 70s. <laughs> but anyway, that's a little piece of history. You had to actually stand up and speak. Now all you have to do is file a little notice if you intend to filibuster, and the Senate can't get anything passed. Uh, I think there's probably a 60% chance that the Republicans will gain control of the Senate. And the two voices <coughs> that uh, are to watch are the two women, uh, Kay Hagan, who you know about, and Michelle Nunn, the um, daughter of uh, Sam Nunn, the Georgia senator. If those two women win, one in Georgia and one here, uh, then uh, I don't think the Republicans will get to Senate. But uh, uh, it's going to be very, very close. There's no question that Obama's unpopularity is uh, hurting the Democrats. In fact, nobody wants to campaign with him, the poor guy. You know, go away, go away. Anything else? Anyway, Steve?
All right, how many did you ask? How many first timers? No? How many first timers? Never been here before. All right, just a few. I thought most of you look fairly, fairly familiar. Um, well, most of you have heard me talk then on, on page three, we're on page three now, about the Roth IRA. Uh, so I won't belabor that point. A lot of people have Roth IRAs. Who all has Roth IRAs here? Lots of people, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, a lot. Okay, so you know about the Roth. We love it. Tax free growth forever. It's fantastic. But um, <clears throat> the one thing I do want to mention, like I, I have in this seminar for several years now, is uh, that, that phrase I've used. Have you heard me say this? Heads you win, tails you break even. You hear me say, what, what's that mean? For those of you who have been in previous seminars. Conversion or not. Yeah, the conversion to recharacterize, sharp crowd. That's right. So what I'm talking about there is if you want to convert from a, a Roth IRA, or from an IRA to a Roth IRA, pick a security that you think has a chance to go way up. So uh, my father used Apple a few years ago. Apple, he converted to $290 a share, something like that. It went to $390 the next year. So... He, he only paid taxes on the 290 a share. So a year later, it's 209. A, 209, I'm sorry, 209. So a year later, it's, uh, it's a much higher. So obviously, he, he likes that. He pays tax on the lower amount. It's a lot higher. But what if it goes the other way, like it did this last year? He converted a, a, a stock called Bioscript, a little $7 stock that now is trading at $6. So do you want to pay tax on $7 when, when it's trading at six a year later? You'd prefer not to, right? So you can do something called a recharacterization. You have until October 15th uh, to recharacterize. In other words, to say, never mind to the IRS. So that's what he did this year. He, he put it back in his IRA, no harm, no foul, no taxes done. So you just take it back out of the, the, the Roth, put it back in the IRA, and you don't have to pay taxes on it. In fact, my column tomorrow in the Winston Sam Journal is all about recharacterization and about this whole topic. So uh, it will be in tomorrow. And, uh, so that's what I mean. Heads, if you take a heads, you win. So if you take something out of your IRA, convert it to your Roth, you've got to pay taxes on it, but now it's going to grow tax-free. If it goes up before October 15th of the following year, then you keep it in there. You win. you got all that tax-free growth. But if it goes down, you just recharacterize it, put it back in, and no taxes due because you don't want to pay tax on that higher amount. Now, why October 15th? That's your tax filing deadline with extensions. So you would have to file an amended tax return if you already you know, did a tax return on April 15th, but it's a way not to have to pay any uh, taxes on something that has gone down. So that's called a recharacterization. It's a fantastic rule. Again, there's no way to lose uh, in this situation. By the end of the calendar year. Now, you still have to pay taxes. If, if you've gained, you still have to pay taxes on that lower amount, like you do with every conversion. Right? So Roth conversions where you t take money out of an IRA, put it in a Roth. We'd all love to do that, but of course you do have to pay taxes on the amount you convert. And if you look at the lower, the lower tax brackets here, right, uh, the uh, tax brackets on the bottom of the page, if you're in that 15% bracket, so for 2014, that means you, you've got taxable income of less than um, $73,801. It's after all your deductions, if you're married, less than $73,000, you then can convert money and pay a 15% federal tax, five and three quarter percent state. I would do that all day long if I was in that low of a tax bracket. So if that's you, I think it's a great idea to convert. You'll be doing your heirs. You'll say, well, I may never use this money. Great. Well, you'll be doing your heirs a favor. When they inherit it, they might be in a much higher tax bracket. So you'd be doing them a favor by paying, paying the tax at the lower rate. Uh, so it all depends on taxes, on whether or not you convert. So keep that in mind. Love Roth conversions, and you can do just little pieces every year if you want. Any questions on that? I don't want to belabor the point because lots of you have... have uh, so you don't have to convert the whole thing, you can just convert piecemeal? Right, we have lots of clients that do that. Uh, the question is, can you just convert piecemeal? Yes, we have lots of clients that do that at Woodard & Company. Uh, when I say lots, I probably mean like five. But anyway, we have every year they'll convert little pieces uh, because that keeps you in that lower tax bracket. I don't want to really throw you into the higher tax bracket because it doesn't seem to make much sense to go from 15 to 25. That's a big jump in taxes. Uh, unless you just know your heirs or in future years you'll be paying a lot higher taxes on that money. If you know that, then of course go ahead and... 
jump up. In the up. 60s, it's a good time to do it because some of you may be tired of not drawing Social Security, but even if you are drawing Social Security, when you start seven and a half, you've got the required minimum distributions, and of course, there's no required minimum distribution from a Roth. Yeah, that's a nice thing. I mean, once you hit seven and a half, if you've got a, a million dollar IRA, at 3.65% uh, the first year, you've got to take out $36,500, right? And that gets slapped onto your income. So you may be in a very low uh, uh, income situation right now. Take advantage of that because those required minimum distributions only go higher and higher. Studies show that your income goes like this through your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. You retire, it goes like this, but then it slowly builds back and for, for on average gets higher than it was when you're working, and that's due to those required minimum distributions. They keep going higher and higher and higher every year. You can just create one. You can open one. Yeah, you can open a Roth. What's that? Uh, Roth can be opened. It doesn't matter when, uh, how old you are if you're doing a conversion. You can't contribute new money to a Roth unless you're working. Again, there are no age limits on the Roth. It's just whether or not you're working uh, determines whether or not you can contribute new money. But Roth conversions can be done at any age. And of course, if you're real high income, you can't convert to Roth. Well, yeah, if you, have, if, you have, if you make too much money, you can't convert to, uh, contribute to a Roth. You can convert any time. And you'll see that. That's all. All those rules are in there. Any other questions on the IRA, the Roth conversions? Good questions. I love questions, by the way, so uh, interrupt me anytime. Okay, the next page. <clears throat> Again, only a few first timers. Most of you have seen this before. It's just our our um, information on 800 numbers, fund families, websites, uh, Scott Trade, etc. Fidelity. Most of you know all that. If you have any questions about that, that you few first timers, you can ask me afterwards. Notice that the, the new and the tiny print down there is a new Scott Trade office. Anybody been there yet? New Scott Trade office here in Winston Salem, next to. Uh, Firebirds or uh, Bricks Pizza, sweet, not Sweet Frog. Uh, what is that? No, it's the ice cream place. Uh, Froger, Froger, yeah, Sweet Frog is in, it's like, they're going on the frog theme for some reason. Sweet Frog is in Clemens, a Froger. Yeah, right right there is where the new Scott Trade office is. Anybody have Scott Trade accounts? All right, so there you go. You probably already heard that new office. <clears throat> All right, page five. This is where we give you the actual um, funds we like. Uh, we break it down, obviously, for the new people. We diversify it. We, we don't want you to have all large cap growth or all of small cap value. So we give you the different sectors, large, small, value, growth, international. So we go through them um, uh, one by one here. Let's start, and we should give you the averages, how they've done. Let's start with the first fund there, Acre Focus. This is one of my father's favorites for um, low risk growth investing. Growth stocks are generally higher risk, right? Growth stocks are the ones that trade at higher multiples, like Facebook right now, 45 times earnings. So for every dollar of earning that Facebook book makes, you're paying $45 to buy the stock. Whereas, three. whereas Delta, you're paying three, three times. So that's a value stock, very, very uh, low priced, uh, <laughs> generally considered safer banks, uh, Oil companies tend to be in there like ExxonMobil, Big Oil, utilities. utilities. They tend to be in the value category. The growth are like the Googles and Facebooks and used to be Krispy Kreme. Uh, way back in the day was considered a growth stock before it came crashing down. And Krispy Kreme is a good example of what can happen when, when <laughs> growth stops. When the music stops, the stock comes down hard, so it's, it's more risky. Well, here is a manager that is kind of a low-risk version of growth investing. This manager favors companies that can grow their earnings steadily, that, that have recurring revenue, like American Tower is his number one holding. Anybody know what American Tower does? Cell, cell phones, right. So they rent, they rent the, uh, the space for the cell phone carriers. They put up the towers, they manage those, and then rent it out. So they have that recurring revenue as Verizon and AT&T pay them every year for that space on their, on their cell phone tower, on these towers they put up. So, he likes that. It's a nice, steady business. Visa, Visa, Mastercard. They have a st same thing. It's a transaction-based business. Who takes who takes the default risk for Visa? If you don't pay your Visa bill, who who's on the hook for that? Visa, the bank. The bank, the bank is on the hook for that. Very intelligent crowd today. I like that. Usually, I get blank stares, but the bank is on the hook for that. 
And um, so Visa has no default risk. So they get that recurring revenue, every transaction, three, four percent is what they make. It's, it's crazy. Uh, I imagine that's part of what Bitcoin is trying to do, go after some of that business. So, uh, and, and somebody's going to try to figure out a way to uh, come in and, and hurt Visa and MasterCard. So keep, keep an eye on that if you own those stocks. Happens to be my largest holding Visa. Not because I dumped a lot of money into it, mostly because it grew into that. I, I uh, bought it a few years ago and it just kept going up and up and I'm like, oh, wow. And now it's kind of stabilized. Now, I, I, uh, I, we talk about stocks a lot here, but keep in mind most of our funds, most of our money is in mutual funds just like we recommend here, what we have for our clients. But we do like to play with the stocks and so that's always fun to talk about, like his Delta. He told me, he comes into my office and says, you have got to buy these airline stocks. And I just couldn't do it because I just have this, this all these airlines that have gone bankrupt in the past again and again and again. It's like, oh, it seems like a fool's errand. But this time, they seem to have gotten religion. Uh, all these baggage fees that you hate, you know, all these tack on fees that you hate $3 have really brought in a lot of revenue. They finally figured out how to be profitable. And so, planes are full. And planes are full. So, so I should have listened to him. Uh, he says that often, but <laughs> I don't always listen. Anyway. Um, he did listen to me on Facebook last year. Now, uh, this manager is not going to own Facebook. Facebook's going to be like in, in the new Millennium Fund. Uh, John Roth, it was because I was meeting with John Roth's right hand person. <clears throat> uh, we were having lunch with him or dinner, I guess it was dinner down in Charlotte, or maybe it was a lunch, um, a year ago, September, and they said they could only own one stock, it would be Facebook. So I came back, I told that story last year. Anybody buy Facebook based on that story that I told last year? I'm just curious. No, I don't blame you. Oh, one person, okay. Well, my dad bought it based on those stories and uh, he's been very happy, but. It's up more than 50%. But this is, yeah, and their earnings come out Tuesday. So for you one gentleman back there that owns it, Tuesday uh, we'll know if <laughs> it'll bounce around. It'll bounce around a lot on Tuesday uh, after earnings come out or Wednesday, I guess. But it could go higher, could go lower. So it's a riskier stock. But they liked it, so I bought it. That's the kind of stuff you'll get with this one. It's more tech, a little more health care. So Fidelity New Millennium is in there. Uh, Prime Cap Odyssey Growth, that fund is kind of uh, a closet, uh, closet health care fund. The top five holdings are health care, biotech health care. So keep that in mind. As you look at these different funds, Prime Cap, they really like health care. They also like the airlines. Uh, they actually see some growth. So sometimes you'll see these names show up in growth managers as well as value managers, and uh, the airlines are doing that right now. Uh, but anyway, I like Prime Cap Odyssey Growth. We've been talking about that for a lot of years. Fidelity Large Cap, uh, that's probably the best fund we don't own. Uh, best, best blend, large cap blend fund. I do own the Oakmark Select. It was the first fund I owned uh, back in 1997. I've told you that before. Very first fund I bought, I'm kind of loyal, so I've kept it all these years. Suffered through that whole Washington Mutual, if you remember Washington Mutual, anybody? It went bankrupt. Uh, that was 17% of this fund at one time. So it's a very concentrated portfolio. He's back, I guess, he's not once bitten, twice shy, because he's back in the financials again. He has a, a ton of Bank America and AIG, uh, some of the biggest centers uh, are in this, uh, of the financial crisis are in this portfolio, but it's been doing well for him. As you can see, his three and five year numbers are fantastic. So if you look at them today, they'll probably be slightly lower because the market's slightly lower than it was. Yeah, a week or so ago, we were saying they were down probably four, four or five percent from these numbers. Now they've, most of them have, have come back nicely. Uh, let me take a, tell you about this, uh, this Guggenheim uh, RSP. This is an ETF. So you'll see here that most of our funds are five symbols. Right, the index, those are open and mutual funds. The ETFs are three symbols, and they're underlined, and they don't have a lot written about them. Those are ETFs. That, that's why you, how you know what, that we're talking about an ETF. Well, RSP is probably my favorite for no-brainer. If you could stick anything in your portfolio, not look at it for 30 years, I would have confidence in this fund more than most others, because this one is an index of the S&P 500, so you can't go far wrong wrong, but it equally weights them. In other words, a regular index, like the Vanguard Index 500, is capitalization weighted. So Apple is going to be 8% of that index because it's such a large part of the market. It's so valuable. $600 billion, Apple. 
Apple, it's worth six hundred billion. This one is two tenths of one percent. Each stock of the five hundred stocks is two tenths of one percent, and it's rebalanced every quarter. So it sells the uh, winners and buys the losers, which fits my mindset. And back studies have shown they outperform the S and P five hundred by half a percent, three quarters of a percent on average over long periods of time. Well, in the ETF space, if you can get three quarters of a percent outperformance, that makes a big difference in the long run. So I like this concept. I like the fund. Uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, fantastic. Now, a Dodge and Cox stock fund on the next page, page six. It's a large cap value fund. Um, like it, they own Hewlett Packard as their top holding. I thought Hewlett Packard was left for dead. I saw this in portfolio. I thought this is crazy, but man, has Hewlett Packard come back? Same thing they did with McDonald's years ago. They owned McDonald's. I remember thinking this: Dodge and Cox, you own McDonald's. Nobody's going to eat McDonald's. Well, that's before McDonald's went on a tear uh, from like 2003 to 2010. Just went crazy, and they owned it. And it's been bad since. Yep. Price value. Um, Mark Finn runs that. The T. Rowe Price uh, representative was just in our office yesterday, and he is really high on Mark Finn, thinks he's a, 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 a genius of an investor. So keep that in mind. He's been uh, knocking it out of the park lately. And uh, there are some of those airlines that, that uh, American Airlines is one of them. If you want to take more risk, you can buy American over Delta. American is more leveraged and you go down more, but it's actually uh, gone up a little faster than Delta than that. Yep. Um, Vanguard Equity Income, that's just a, a solid, solid fund, very low risk. All right. Let's move on to the mid caps. <clears throat> Fidelity mid cap we like, but let me say something about Eventide Hennessy. This is I like mid caps as a rule. I like mid caps because mid caps have the ability to still grow. They're not so large like Apple and Microsoft and Walmart that it's really tough. Walmart for Walmart to move the needle. I mean it's tough. They're, they've saturated uh, the world it seems. And to really move that needle, it's it's harder and harder to grow earnings on such a large base. The law law of large numbers, and that's part of the reason Apple um, is is so cheap. You take out cash and Apple trades like 12 times earnings, something like that. It's, it's a cheap stock, even though it's still growing pretty decently. Uh, and this Apple Pay thing, I don't know, um, have anybody tried Apple Pay? I didn't want to show you this. Uh, I like Apple, own Apple. Dad owns far more of it than I uh, But it's hard to move the needle, but they tried this Apple Pay thing. And so I, I set it up yesterday or two days ago. And there's my first transaction. I was in Subway. We went out to eat with my father and um, uh, another gentleman. It was like a business lunch. So I con convinced these guys yesterday, let's go walk into Subway after we were done and let's try this. So they had three cookies. Three cookies for uh, $1.50. So uh, one for each of us. So um, I went up there. I said, has anybody done this yet? The guy says, I don't think so. And then the girl says, yeah, like two other people have. So went up there. The machine's right there. I did this. This is high paper. Oh, buck six, something like this. Done. Dr. Wallet took my cookies that fast. It was fantastic. You just put your fingerprint on there and it, it charges my credit card. So there's my first one. It gives you history. It's my Chase credit card. It's a digital wallet. Right there it is. Fantastically convenient. And I'm a bit of a germaphobe. So not having to, not having to, to uh, change money, it's like, ah, oh, so dirty. You know that. But even, even uh, credit cards, you know, you're handing credit cards back and forth. Granted, that's a little cleaner because it's just your credit card, but still. Um, and it's absolutely 100% safe. Nobody can hack it because it's got a 16 digit individualized number for every transaction that is totally hack proof. But, but um, yeah, it's, totally, it's, it's only created for that one transaction. Even if somebody intercepts the, the little radio signal, they can't use it again. Did you get the problem fixed with double charging? Uh, well, that's the downside, that you do get double charged for everything. So, it's, it's, no, that was just Bank of America credit cards. It looks like they did get that fixed. Uh, yeah, the bank, some reason in Bank of America, they were double charging some people uh, for transactions. So that, that would be a downside to uh, <laughs> But mine's with Chase, and I only got charged once, so I'm happy about that. <clears throat> but anyway, my whole point was even Apple Pay, as cool as that is, the revenue stream on that is, 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 would be great for a small company. It might really grow their earnings. But for Apple, it's just going to be an incremental new revenue stream for them as they get 
a piece of that transaction. We don't know exactly how they're getting paid yet, but they're probably getting a little piece from Visa or something of that transaction. So, but mid caps, mid caps can still move that needle, right? Some innovation like that could really move it. But on the other hand, they're not so small as to have the default risk. And you know, a small company, something goes wrong, you know, uh, they don't get a loan paid or the, the business, you know, the, the, the companies can tank. So I love mid caps. It's my favorite category. Uh, it's some stability yet with some growth opportunity. So that was a long story to say I like mid caps for the reason they still have the chance to grow. Now, Eventide, the first one there, this manager runs a biotech and a healthcare fund that my father will talk about in a minute. We like Eventide. I would recommend you go out and buy this fund tomorrow. I think it's a fantastic fund. Uh, Eventide Gilead. What I like about this one over the healthcare fund is, is if you're in a healthcare fund, right? If you're running a healthcare fund or a financial fund or a tech fund, and let's say you no longer like healthcare, can you decide to buy industrials? No. By prospectus, you have to buy healthcare, so you just got to find something in there to buy. So the manager's kind of stuck. Where in this fund, you give the same manager the freedom to go to industrials, which he has a lot of industrials here, healthcare, uh, technology. He can kind of move it around. So I like giving my manager a little more freedom that way. Plus, I do, I do like healthcare, so you're going to get a big slug of healthcare in here because that's his bias. Uh, therefore, I think this is a great pick. And he likes to buy uh, things that he feels adds to society. In other words, uh, adds to productivity, wealth, health. Like So he buys Tesla. Uh, he buys even some of the, uh, the, the stuff that's producing oil, uh, the natural gas. He likes that. He thinks that's going to add to society. So it's his version of adding to society. But he wants things that, that uh, so if you like a do-gooder fund, this would, this would fit. He doesn't tend to buy, uh, you know, big brokerage firms or insurance companies that he doesn't think really add or to, tobacco. to or tobacco that he doesn't think really adds to society. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Beer companies probably not either. Uh, let's go next to the next category. AMG Southern Sun. Michael Cook runs this <coughs> fund. This doesn't have a very long record. And again, those of you who come many years, you know, we like new funds, right? Why do we like new funds? Potential, yeah, small, small asset base. So if you think about it, if you're a manager and you're managing five billion dollars and you decide to take a position in uh, some small stock, it you can't you can't buy much of it because you have to put so much money in that little small stock to, to move the needle again. Again, law of large numbers. You can't get in and out of stocks. Well, here's a manager who has a proven record at a small cap fund, Southern Sun, their small cap equity fund. It's closed. You can't buy it. He starts a new fund in the mid-cap space, a space I love, from a proven manager, small asset base. Now, he's already up to uh, nine, oh, wait, where is it? Uh, se $700 million, $720 million. So he's, it's not tiny asset base that, you know, enough people like us know about him that have been buying it. But still, $700 million is still a small enough asset base where he can move it around. And I like he's in Memphis, Tennessee, in the heartland. So all this infrastructure build out that's going on from North Dakota to Eagle Fur to Marcellus Shale, all these pipelines and all this fracking and all this, this oil sands, that all this, 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 these jobs we're creating, um, he, he's going to be able to, to, to uh, benefit from that and, and be right there in the heartland. And what's remarkable is he, no other manager has 52% in industrials. Yeah, so, so he, he's not afraid to, he's not a bench hugger. A lot of managers, they just hug, a benchmark hugger. They just, they just hug the benchmark. In other words, whatever they're tied to, the S&P 500, they just kind of look like that. He won't look like that. He'll go where he thinks the, uh, the value is, where he thinks the, uh, the opportunity is. And so I like managers like that as well. This Aston, this is a mid-cap fund. Uh, it's supposed to be closed. You can only buy this through Scott Trade. We told them it's supposed to be closed. They said no. You can actually buy it for $100 at Scott Trade. So if you've got a young person that's trying to start a Scott Trade account, you know, Roth IRA, for 100 bucks they can buy this fund. It's like the only fund on here we know that you can just start with $100. Because it's a mistake. And we told them it's a mistake, but they won't listen to us, so we're telling you. I called Aston Fairpoint and asked them, they said, oh, no, we're closed everywhere. So when I told Scott Trade it was a mistake, they said, no, it's still open. And I had, uh, I had traded a stock, and I had $179 <coughs> in my, my big IRA account. 
And so I tested it about four months ago, and every time I have left money left over from trade stocks, I bought this fund 17 times, and now I own $9,000 worth of it. And it's the only female man fund we know. So we like the fund, and, and so there's a loophole for you. Take advantage of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's good fun. All right, uh, mid-cap value, there's, uh, there's a good category too. I don't want to, I got to keep moving here. My father's going to talk about small caps, so we'll get back to small caps. He's got some things he wants to say on that in particular, so we're going to let him do that. Let's move to page seven to the hybrid funds. I tell people most seminars that this is the, for, for those of you who have gray hair, maybe you're losing your hair, this is, this is the page for you, this next page and a half. Uh, these are the more cautious funds. Uh, hybrid funds has stocks and bonds, right? So if you stick bonds and stocks in the same fund, you're going to get a lower risk fund. That's just the way it is. So these are lower risk funds from good managers. My father has an article back there. Most of you got that. Tiptoeing the market with these low risk funds. And the two he's recommending, this was uh, in the Winston-Salem Journal, the two he was recommending, oh, and by the way, on the back is... Uh, Icon talking about Apple. But the two that my father recommends are FPA and Vanguard Wellesley. These are the two lowest risk of even these low risk funds. A Dodge and Cox balance is fantastic. Uh, we already talked about them. Fidelity Puritan has Apple as their largest holding. But FBA Crescent, he's not afraid to raise cash. 42% in cash last we looked. He's had as high as 48% cash. He's had as low as about 15 or 20 uh, in the time I've really been watching him over the last several years. So he's not afraid to, to, to raise some cash when he thinks things are overvalued. I would imagine during this downturn, he was putting some of that cash in, which is what you want a manager like this to do. So he's going to really lower the risk for you because he's not afraid uh, to raise cash. Wellesley, anybody own Vanguard Wellington? All right, Wellington is closed. You can't buy that. T.O. Price, by the way, anybody own T.O. Price Capital Appreciation? I better see at least half the name for uh, Not quite half. But anyway, we've been talking about that fund for eons, right? Well, it closed in June. Wellington closed. So some of our favorite hybrid funds have closed. But here's Wellesley run by the Wellington team. It's still open. Why do they leave this one open? Because by mandate, it has to be 60, 65 percent uh, bonds and only 35 percent roughly stocks. So it, it's whereas most hybrid funds are the opposite, 70 percent stocks, 30 percent bonds, right? So Wellesley's still open. You can still get the great team, but keep in mind you're going to get a larger slug of bonds, which, frankly, aren't really paying that much right now. Although, what is, the, what is about the best performing area of the market right now uh, for this year? What? Well, not stock market. Let's say the stocks or bonds for the whole market. What? Bonds. Which, which bonds exactly? Well, Munich have done well, but... but uh, Something's done better than Munich. Something that we, we told you to sell like last year. <laughs> what? No? It's, it's tied to uh, a country you live in. Treasuries, yes. Treasuries, put in your treasuries. Holy crap, you made 22% this year. Who would have thought? Interest rates, why? You're saying, why have treasuries? I thought you told me to sell treasuries last year. Well, we did. But why have they done so well? Because we, like half the rest of the world, uh, are idiots and thought interest rates were going to start moving higher. So with the U.S. Treasury, with the U.S. government, is there a default risk? No. I mean, some of you conspiracy theorists would say, yes, uh, the whole world's going to blow up. Okay, whatever. But assuming the whole world doesn't blow up, we can print money. They're, they're going to pay their bills. There's no default risk. What kind of risk is there in Treasuries? <coughs> interest rate risk, inflation risk, right. So if inflation comes, interest rates go up. If you've got a 30-year bond paying 2.2%, well, actually, 2 30, I'm sorry, 30 years, 2.93%, and interest rates go to 4%, what happens to the underlying value of your bond? It goes down. Because if you want to sell that 3% bond, yet they can go on the open market, any investor can buy a 4% bond, are they going to buy your 3% bond? No. So you've got to discount the price to make up for that lack of interest rate. Uh, that, that you get, so therefore the price goes down. But no default risk. Well, with this first bond fund, double line floating rate fund, it has no interest rate risk, but it has default risk. We're on page eight now, top of page eight. So floating rate fund is 
those are loans made to companies that maybe can't get uh, the, high, uh, the high credit rating. They can't get Microsoft kind of loans at 2%. They have to get their loans based on prime. So right now, Hilton, Hilton uh, Hotels did a loan recently at 2 and 3 quarter percent above prime, or 6%. Prime is 3 and a quarter percent. And prime is tied to what? The Fed funds rate, right? So when the Fed starts raising rates, then Hilton is going to pay a higher rate. So it's floating. So when rates get raised, Hilton then pays the higher rate because it's based on prime. So there's no interest rate risk, but there is default risk. So if you're concerned about interest rates moving up, this is a fund to be in. You're still not going to make much money. 2.9% is the yield right now because obviously not every deal is structured. A lot of the loans they buy are actually higher quality companies that are only paying 3 Three and a half percent. They're paying right at prime. Hilton is an absolute substitute for money market. Hilton, yeah, Hilton is a little lower. Hilton is a little lower quality. And the reason it hasn't done so well, there was actually a big default. Uh, I was like, why haven't they done so well? And found out yesterday there was a big default in the bank loan floating rate market here not too long ago, and so that kind of scared the market. These aren't guaranteed, right? Because again, the companies can default, so that's why it's only up one percent this year. Fidelity New Markets Income. This is an emerging markets bond fund. So bad year last year, good year this year. Emerging markets have bounced back. It is dollar denominated, so you don't have to worry about currency risk. That's nice. Uh, Luma sales bond. All of you own Luma sales bond, right? Let me see the hands. Luma sales bond. Who owns it? Okay, big chunk of you. Only American bond fund I own. I own two bonds, Fidelity New Markets and Luma sales. I don't if you've been coming to this seminars for any amount of time and you are, are concerned about risk and own a bond fund and don't own this one, well, I don't know what to say. Just shame on you. Now, if you don't own any bond funds, that's great. But, uh, I mean, if, if <laughs> this guy's been good for a lot of years. Um, well, he's really over the hill. He's 80. Yeah, I should put him out to pasture. <laughs> you know, my father's 78. I've been trying to get him to retire forever, but he won't do it. I can't take over the company. I thought about an airplane ride. Roller coaster, an accident. <laughs> Just kidding, boy. Uh, <laughs> he's not laughing at all. But hopefully he'll be around for a lot of years. Hopefully until uh, he's 100. My great dream, seriously, I, my wife laughed at me. So my great dream is to write my last newspaper column on my 100th birthday and say, now that I'm three digits, I'm no, no longer going to write for the Winston Sam Joe. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I uh, uh, happy to work with my dad. Hopefully we'll work together for many, many years to come. Um, Matthews Asia, strategic income, good fund there, MetWest. MetWest is an unconstrained bond fund, so go anywhere. So if you want to give your manager kind of the same latitude that you gave Steve Romick at FPA Crescent, go anywhere. You can't buy stocks, but uh, just about anything else, uh, here's a good one, MetWest, unconstrained bond. Osterweiss, River North we like a lot. <coughs> and uh, municipals, anybody own that Dupree fund? I'm just curious. Dupree municipal, yeah, okay, I knew a few of you did. We talked to you, yeah, Harry, you own that. Um, so we've liked that one for a lot of years. I honestly didn't think it would do as well as it's done this year, but again, with interest rates coming down, municipals have done well as well. Uh, Tax-free. Nuveen is a, you're saying, Nuveen, wow, you're saying I get 4.9% tax-free, free from federal, free from state. Yes, you can with Nuveen, but it's a closed-in fund. And closed-in funds use leverage. In other words, they borrow to buy more, so they're more risky. As you can see, last year down 17%. I'll probably, in all honesty, take this thing off the list next year uh, once it comes back. Uh, this fund only shows up every so often on our list because uh, if, it, if it really comes roaring back, it's too risky. We don't recommend it. Uh, but right now, I think it's a good value. Individual stocks, Southern Company, Spectra Energies, Artisan Partners. These are other income ideas. My father wanted me to come up with some other income ideas. For those of you searching for yield, you want that regular income. Here's a few stocks that I own <coughs> that I think you can own. You see Duke Energy is not on there, and I know I'm going to get run out on a rail here as soon as I say this, but I personally would sell Duke Energy uh, today. Now, I could be early. I probably am. I was talking to John Woodard about that. He thinks, he thinks I'm a little early on that. The reason I left Southern Company on there, although it's also utility and utilities have run up, is because it's at least still yielding more than Duke. It's yielding 4.4%. I think Duke is down to 4%. It's over $80 a share. Trades at like 26. All-time high. All-time high. Trades at 26 times earnings. 
and only yields 4%. For utility, I don't know, has anybody ever seen Duke yield less than 4% ever? I can't recall it since in 97 anyway. Anybody? No? And John says he doesn't believe so. So for Duke to yield less than 4%, you say, what's going on? It's the same trade as the Treasury. The 10-year U.S. Treasury got under 2%. So it's a belief that interest rates aren't going up and the world is maybe going into deflation. If that happens, you'll make a lot more money by keeping your Duke. Because people basically look at Duke Energy's dividend as almost as safe as the Treasury market. Wouldn't you say? I mean, almost as safe. I mean, it, what kind of world do we live in where Duke can't pay its dividend payment? Right? I mean, it's a reg basically a regulated utility that we all have to use. So the odds of that dividend going away are slim. But now, its dividend payout ratio is really high. In other words, it's paying out most of what it makes. Not most, but it's got a little bit of room. But it doesn't have the room to raise its, its payout as much as, let's say, Southern Company does or Spectra Energy. That's why I like Spectra. Spectra Energy grew its dividend 10% last year. Duke grew its dividend from 78 cents a share to 79.5, so 2%. So Duke is going to grow that dividend so much slower. And for McDonald's, International Paper, Microsoft, uh, Spectra Energy, any of them, Apple, they're going to grow that dividend so much faster. And you're not giving that much yield up. Now, in the case of Apple, it's only like 2%, so you are giving up quite a bit of yield. But Spectre, you're giving up a half a percent for a much faster growing dividend. So I like it. I think there are other places you want to go right now if you're looking for yield than, uh, than Duke. But again, it is a safe dividend. These maximum limited partnerships, let me just say a word about them. My father mentioned this oil production. I have a little uh, chart here of, of all the uh, oil production that's going on and, and what, what it would look like. North Dakota alone, one million barrels a day it's more than the country, or basically the same as the country of Oman. The United Arab Emirates, the UAE, Texas, 2.9 million barrels a day. Texas creates as much as the UAE. Venezuela would be this blue region. Uh, poor, poor East Coast, we only do 40, uh, 450,000 barrels a day, and that's as much as Ukraine. There's the UK, Ecuador, Libya, the whole Midwest, 237, uh, sorry, 2 million. 300, uh, no, sorry. Well, I'll pass that around. Sure. Anyway, I uh, got that wrong. It was, we're only 45,000 barrels a day, 237,000 barrels a day. Yeah, the East Coast doesn't really pr produce so much oil. Now, we do have all that gas up in the Marcellus Shale up in uh, Pennsylvania that's being produced. So there's a lot of natural gas being produced, but not a lot of oil. But all this activity, all this stuff you've heard about, the American Renaissance that's going on, these MLPs, these Master Limited Partnerships, to they're involved in the midstream ones. There's upstream that find the stuff. There's midstream that transport it, gather it, process it, store it. And then there's downstream people that, that, that use it. I like the midstream because it's a very stable business. It's like a toll road. Anybody take the West Virginia Turnpike? You know, how many tolls do you get, right? Three, two bucks a piece. So three times as I'm going home to Indiana, it's like I got to pay $2 uh, each time. Well, that's like, like these are, are like toll roads for the natural gas industry or the oil industry. A lot of it's coming out on, on rail cars, but a lot of it's being shoved through these pipelines, being stored. And that's what these MLPs, these master limited partnerships do. And so you can buy them in the ETF structure. You don't have to worry about K1s like you do if you buy the individual MLPs directly. For instance, Spectra Energy, the spinoff from Duke, that's a general partner Spectra Energy Partners, SEP, is the MLP. If you buy that directly, you get a K-1. But you can buy it in these, these um, ETFs in this structure without the K-1s. So you can buy them in, in your uh, IRAs, anywhere you want them. And if you buy them in a taxable account, most of that income is tax-free. You say, oh, Steve, you're blowing me away. You're saying there's tax-free income? Sort of. It's considered a return of principal. So your cost basis gets lowered. So every time you get a dividend in, let's say, the Alarian Fund, let's take the AMLP, it's right there in the middle. That's the one I'm, I've done the most research on. 6% dividend, a little over 6% payout. And it comes back to you as a return of capital. 90, 90 plus percent of it does. So your cost basis gets lowered. Eventually, when your cost basis gets to zero, then you have to start paying taxes on that. 
But at that time, you could do one of two things. You could donate it to charity, which then would be free, and you would then rebuy it and step up your cost basis, or you could die. If you die, then uh, <laughs> I'm just bombing today. Uh, <laughs> most people, <laughs> most people, do, most people don't want that choices. So, so, but, but there, but if your heirs inherit it, it does get a stepped up cost basis. So keep that in mind. You, uh, you know, so you can have a plan to give it away. But for the in the meantime, it's going to take a while to get that uh, cost basis down to zero. You're going to get basically tax-free income. Or if you have offsetting tax-free losses, you could sell, I mean, capital losses, you could sell it, take the gain. But I love master limited partnerships. You can see them down there. They're all involved in, uh, in this energy infrastructure. And the final idea I'll give you, this is also another one of those closed-in funds that we talk about occasionally, but DSL. DSL is run by Jeffrey Gunlack and his team, Double Line Income Solutions, at the very bottom of the page here. 8.5% dividend, or 8.4% dividend. It trades at a discount, which means you're buying 100% of the assets for 92 cents on the dollar. So it's like it's on sale right now. And that's because it's a closed-in fund. I don't really want to get into all that. But the bottom line is, run by a fantastic manager, you're getting more of your um, value for a discount. It's on sale. And you'll get 8.5% dividend. Love DSL. If you're looking for income, I've owned this thing for a year. It's done fantastically well. Questions, comments about any of the? Yes. Uh, would the possibility of the probability of rising interest rates not be a factor in looking at limited sales? Sure. Mm -hmm. I sold my limited sales for that reason. I said if you own bond funds, you lose for that. <laughs> I, uh, I did. If, I said if you haven't had it and you own a bunch of bond funds. But that would be true for almost every bond fund, right? Sure, sure. So I'm saying if you got to own a bond fund, limited sales is the one, one of the ones to own. Okay. Now, you could own Jeffrey Gunlack's DSL because of the discount. You could, you could go elsewhere. But I'm just saying, if you've been coming this year and you've never owned it, I, I just sold mine only because I got the high yield. I was like, I was done with bonds. I want to be done with bonds totally. My father really is. I think you still own Luma Sales. Well, I own very little. In fact, they're probably my two smallest positions, Luma Sales Bond and Fidelity New Markets Income, simply because those are my two favorite bond funds. And if somebody asks me for bond fund recommendations, uh, I want to own the fund. So. And we own a ton of this for our clients. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Yeah, fund. $21 million for our clients. In the bond world, that's a great fund, but it's just bonds in general. Right? In fact, if you look at Luma Sales, of all our recommendations, he's got a three-year average and a five-year average of 9%. Last year, when bonds were down 1% in 2013, he was up 6 Yes? Um, I invest in, for my sister in a brokerage account, and it's not an IRA. Um, her tax guy gets really mad when I make a lot of money for her. What can I do in that account that is um, uh, the best fund to put in a taxable account? Well, that, that's going to be difficult. Are you trading a lot, or, or are you uh, just because of the capital gain distributions, or what? Well, I'm not trading a lot. Okay. It's just well, master limited partnerships would well, work well. AMLP, like I said, that's all return principle. That won't be taxable. Mm -hmm. Any bond fund is going to be the worst. So anytime you put a bond fund in there, they're lower risk, but all that income is, is fully taxable. Yeah, remember, capital gains are taxed at 15% for most people, unless they're in a very high tax bracket, and it's 20. But uh, bonds are taxed at income tax rates, the same as on page 3. You can do, do the municipal bonds. Again, you know, that'll be tax-free, but they come with some risk. Uh, and then ETFs generally are more tax efficient. If you worry about the capital gain distributions from the mutual fund companies, ETFs generally are more tax efficient. But mostly what I would tell the guy is, look, would you rather have him lose money so you don't pay taxes? That's what we tell people. It's like, I'm real happy to make money and pay taxes on it. Well, I, I know. You don't, want, you don't want to do it short-term trading, but if, right. if, if you think something like Duke, if you think it's run up and you're like, you got to pay some taxes, I would be more hesitant to sell Duke, by the way, in a taxable account than I would in an IRA. But, yeah. 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 yeah it oh, it. probably should be on my list. It only, but it only pays about two percent. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, I like the theme of dividend growth. So I like. Well, how, you know, as far as rising interest rates, well, that would, would that affect? No. 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 no rising interest rates. Yeah. Rising interest rates won't affect the stocks. 
uh, like McDonald's and uh, Spectra Energy as much. Duke it would, but those are the growing uh, dividend. Apple, rising interest rates don't matter much to Apple. They're going to keep increasing that dividend regardless. In fact, I would argue you get a hedge, having a much better hedge against rising interest rates in a, a growing dividend because it's going to keep growing. Whereas Treasury, 30-year Treasury, they don't grow that, they don't grow that distribution at all. No, that's probably 7,500 stocks. Yeah, probably. Did. That's why it's only 2% because they can't just cherry pick the actual investment. Yeah. Question back here? Yes. Sir. Yes. yes. Uh, oh, BSL, Jeffrey Gunlack, first question. What is he investing in primarily? And second, how risky is he? Well, very astute. About half of it is in emerging markets. So <laughs> keep that in mind. I like the emerging market space, so it's not a, it's not a treasury fund. You can't get that kind of yield, obviously, in treasuries. Uh, and the other half would be in corporate bonds, uh, some, some Ginnie Mays, you know, some Fannie Mae, Ginnie Mae kind of stuff, just a, ver a variety of other stuff. But yeah, that is, that is more risky than his double line funds, for sure. Obviously, anytime you look at, at returns like that, or yields like that, they come with more risk. Right now, I think it's a good risk. That's why it's on there. It probably won't be on there in a year or two when I, when I think it's no longer a good risk reward ratio. Yes. Are the uh, MLPs, um, would you recommend we that up for an elderly person? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anybody. I mean, because well. Because of the air situation? Okay. Well, okay. I recommend it for anybody. Only because if you're looking for a, a diversifier that gives you a steady. What happened is some of these MLPs, one of the energy transfer partners, I believe it is has raised their dividend 40 out of the last 42, not years, 40 out of the last 42 quarters. They're raising their dividend every quarter. And that's why they got hit so bad when oil, when oil went down, these MLPs really got hit recently. A week ago, Clemens, I was telling everybody in Clemens, I was like, buy these things tomorrow morning on Wednesday morning. I said it with both hands. But I don't say that to you guys because they've already bounced back. But at that time, they, were, they got crushed. Crushed me, and they went from nineteen dollars a share to MLP down to like sixteen sixty. That's a pretty that's a that's a butt kicking when it comes to MLPs. But the, the concern was that if you don't produce more oil, you can't grow these dividends. In other words, if, if the activity shuts down in America, and you buy these things for that dividend growth, so anything that's going to hamper that dividend growth is going to hurt MLPs. But no, I would recommend it. If oil prices go down to seventy, sixty-five dollars a barrel, they're going to get hit. Yeah, because if you shut in all these wells, if you stop. If you stop producing, you, you're not going to be able to, to, to uh, grow that di distribution. You're still going to get that distribution, but it's not going to grow as fast. Okay, it's one more question. Not worth as much. Uh, if you own it, uh, the DSL will allow you to reinvest if you set it up that way, I think. No. Uh, now, maybe Schwab. But, not with Fidelity, but. Uh, well, maybe Fidelity, too. And that's not a bad way to, uh, to be compounded. But as an alternative, would you go to. Say, if you really don't need it for income for the next 15 years, might you look at an alternative like uh, River Nord or Delta Markets? Yes, I like River. I li well, if you don't need the income, I like River North and Fidelity New Markets. If you want the income, then DSL makes sense to me. Yeah, we could buy it either way. Just the DSL, if you can't reinvest, you can just buy some more every so often. Okay, let's go do small cap growth real quickly. Um, Meridian small cap growth, if you look on page uh, 14, it's my favorite, uh, probably new fund that started uh, last year. Chad Neves, Brian Schwab. Think about that. Over seven years, Janet Strike, which we had recommended, they beat the market by 4% a year. And uh, through October 10th, uh, they were up 5% uh, through October 10th. And the Vanguard small cap growth index was down seven. They were beating their peers by 12%. That's unheard of. Anyway, best new fund. We like new funds because when the manager starts a new fund, what happens? He doesn't have to make any sell decisions. All he has to do is buy all the savings. Now, all you know, sell decisions are much tougher than buying decisions. We, you know, we thought we... Believed in Tesla back in 2010, 2011. I bought my wife's account in the 20s. I bought some from me in the 30s. She likes his tickets. Keys. Oh, she keys his stuff. My nephew's with us and he's locked his stuff in his car. He's leaving. Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And uh, so I said, okay, Tesla's a good buy. And when it got to 70, I had more than doubled our money and my wife kind of tripled it. And I said, okay, I'm gonna sell, but I'm gonna hold 200 shares for the rest of my life. I really believe in this. When I got to 120, a month later, I sold it all. Now it's a 240. Uh, and it happens, you know, it happens all the time. On the other hand, when Apple got to 700, uh, which would be split adjusted 100 uh, back two years ago, uh, did I sell any? No. It went to 385. But I did buy some more at 400 and some, so, and that's why Apple's my largest holding. But it's interesting now, because I bought Delta, United, overdid it, American and Alaskan Airlines. If you take all the airline stocks put together, they're now bigger than my position in Apple. But anyway, Meridian small cap growth is terrific. Um, the Fidelity Event Driven Opportunity Fund, give you a handout. The Fidelity people are really high on this fund. It hasn't done so well this year, as you can see, but they're gonna use special events to come up with um, master bankruptcies, man, they'll have obscure stocks you never heard of. The only worry about this fund is this guy that runs it has four A's in his last name. I've never seen a last name with four A's in it. <laughs> I like this. Obviously he's uh, Indian or Pakistani, but uh, oh, there's his picture right there. So uh, anyway, uh, so those are our favorite two new funds and uh, both of them are small caps. And most of you know small caps, 15% downturn from uh, July 1st to uh, October 10th are much more dangerous, but over the long run, since 1920, and this includes the stock market crashes, of, since 1926, of course, large cap uh, stocks have averaged 10%, small cap stocks have averaged 12. And nobody would buy small caps if they uh, didn't produce more because they're so much higher risk. And one that's not very high risk, Walt Hoosen Select Value, he has a closed fund, a small cap value fund that has a top 3% record. This is his uh, other fund that he reopened. And uh, so the Meridian small cap growth, the Fidelity event driven opportunities, and the Walt Hoosen select value are my favorite four small caps. In global funds, my artist in global small cap, which is one of my absolute favorites, is having a terrible year. You know, it has a bunch of money, half its money in Europe. It's very aggressive small cap fund. Small cap growth has been decimated, but given the fact they have a, a record going back more than 15 years, nearly 20 years, I'm still hanging on to it. Oakmark Global Select has been disappointing too, but I still believe in it. Uh, if you want a low risk fund, uh, FMI International, uh, top 1% in 2011, the average international fund went down 11% in 2000 and, um, 11, you can see Dodge and Cox went down 16, Causeway went down 11, it only went down two. So if you want a low risk, all these funds are being hurt because they have a lot of Europe. But at some point, Europe is gonna rebound. Europe stocks are probably 40% cheaper than US stocks. And they're not even hit their all time highs. Uh, they haven't even hit their highs from the, from the uh, crash. I like emerging markets, I think that's, even though they're higher risk by definition, I think that's a good place to be. This dry house emerging small cap growth was recommended in Mutual Fund Observer. How many read Mutual Fund Observer? You, if you're interested in mutual funds, you've got to read that. I get more ideas from it, it's free. You go to Mutual Fund Observer, you sign up. Uh, the first day of the month or second day of the month, they'll send you an email saying Mutual Fund Observer is now available. It's written by a, a uh, college prof in Illinois. He's really good, he's sometimes sarcastic, he's sometimes humorous, uh, he, but he's excellent. And uh, I get good ideas from there. Uh, Matthews Asia Small Companies, she can choose from 22,000 small companies. She's got 36% in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, plus 18% in India. But the next fund, the newer fund, Matthews Emerging Asia, cannot own China, cannot own Japan, cannot own Hong Kong, because I own Taiwan uh, because it is emerging Asia. So it must buy Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam. And of all the funds we buy for our clients, and we only buy Matthews Emerging Asia for our most aggressive clients, it's doing the best this year. It's up 17%. And of course, the one that's doing, this is not a misprint, what happened? 
They elected a new pro-capitalist leader in May, and this finally has taken off. Look how volatile India is. Up 33% in 2010, down 36 in 2011, up 32 in 2012, down 6% last year when we were up 30 plus percent, up 52 this year. I bought a little bit of it in May, and I'm up about 25% because I thought this guy was going to win the election. It was pretty, pretty, and it, it, they would go up. In India, if you want to start a new business, it takes a year of paperwork to get permission from the government to start a new business, historically, and he's trying to change that. Seafarer, overseas growth and income. If you want an emerging markets fund, if you want to be in this space and you don't want risk, this guy ran Matthews Asia Growth and Income for 10 years. It was in the top 5%. He started his own firm in back in 2012. Again, Mutual Fund Observer picks him as a great place to be. This fund will not be volatile. You can see last year when emerging market funds did zero, he was up five. This year when they're up two, he's up three. I like Mexico. The same thing has happened in Mexico. They had a pro-market uh, leader elected in uh, December 2012. And, uh, and finally it took him uh, almost two years to get the stuff through the legislature. But what did Mexico do in August that was unparalleled in Mexican history in 76 years? Anybody know? Yeah, the oil thing. Yeah, the oil thing. What they did is, think about this. In 1938, uh, I was two years of age, and I kind of remember this. In 1938, um, the Mexicans said, if you gringos, you're ripping us off, you're right in the midst of the Depression, uh, we're going to kick all Standard Oil and all the companies, all the oil companies out of Mexico, and we're going to nationalize it. So Mexico took over the oil production, kicked out all the American companies in 1938, and for 76 years have had one oil company responsible for all the oil exploration in Mexico. Corruption, political, well, can you imagine the government owning the only oil company in the whole country? Anyway, it's been a disaster. Uh, Mexican oil production has gone down, down, down recently, even though they got great proven reserves because they don't have the equipment, they don't have the infrastructure. So what the Mexican government approved in August was inviting American companies in to bid on helping Pemex uh, develop uh, Mexican oil. And it can be in a partnership. They can take payments in oil. They can take pay payments in Mexico pesos. They can have leases. Uh, and it's going to revolutionize Mexican oil production. The U.S. Energy Administration up, at the end of August, up Mexico's future production for the next 10 years by 75% because they thought it would make that much difference. And uh, Mexico also has free trade agreement with 52 different, 42 different countries. So if uh, Nissan and all the Japanese, all, uh, all the Japanese companies are producing tons of cars in Mexico, if Nissan ships a uh, Nissan Sentra built in Mexico to Brazil, they basically pay no taxes and they can sell it at market prices. If that Nissan Sentra is built in America and we ship it to Brazil, we don't have a free trade agreement with Brazil because stupid Congress people. But anyway, um, then it's taxed with 25, 30% in tariffs. So no American, no cars produced in America are ever sold in Brazil. So Mexico has more free trade agreements than anybody else in the world. And if you want to buy the ETF, uh, the Mexican hasn't done much this year, but I think it's got great potential long term. Okay, uh, page 10. Biotech and healthcare. Um, if you look at that third paragraph, uh, there's the uh, Finney Coravella has an MD and a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology from Harvard. Uh, he's uh, got uh, more education. His fund is really struggling this year after being up 62% last year because he's got some of the small unknown uh, healthcare. But the one I really like is Fidelity Select Healthcare. Look at these records, and this is only through September 30th. Five years, 28, 26, 24, 45, 20, 37, 39. And uh, two of them are all biotech, which make them extremely high risk. But Fidelity Healthcare <coughs> is more diversified. He also runs the medical equipment fund, so he's got medical equipment stocks. His name is Edward Yoon. He's been there for uh, uh, right at five years, and this fund has just been sensational, and it's one of my largest holdings. Now, I met him uh, two years ago at a conference in uh, Boston, 
And I got to talk to him afterwards, and he told me to buy Novartis because Novartis had the best uh, uh, treatment for, for um, diabetes and given the uh, obesity epidemic in the United States. So I did, and it's done quite well. But my colleague Todd was there in May, and Fidelity, and since he's their star manager, Fidelity trots him out to speak to the people coming in from all the country. And Todd said that he really stuck his neck out. He said, given all these incredible breakthroughs in biotech, I am going to make a prediction that most of you are going to think I am crazy. And he said, within 10 years, we'll have a cure for every major form of cancer. Now that is sticking your neck out. Uh, and that's why I like healthcare. Number one is the tremendous breakthroughs are sensational. Uh, sequencing the human genome. Uh, this company, uh, which I recommended two weeks ago, is up 18% uh, in the last two weeks, but it's selling at 121 times earnings. Uh, 121, uh, what is it selling at? Uh, 107 times earnings. So number one, the breakthroughs. Number two, I hate to say that people are all older. When we get older, we all need more health care. And number three, for the enemies called Obamacare, the official name is the Affordable Care Act, the government is making, subsidizing, and making insurance available to more people. And we all know the rule. When you have more of something that you don't have to pay for, you use it more. Right? So with health care for older people, more of it, and the breakthroughs, it's my favorite sector. And we own seven things, and we own these four mutual funds, and then we own three, uh, three stocks, uh, Novartis and Illumina. But the one I like the best, I think, is the safest. Unfortunately, it's up about 15, 18 percent since I recommended it uh, two weeks ago at Clemens, is Gilead. Um, it gets a five-star rating. It has a successful treatment for hepatitis. Uh, so anyway, consider if you don't have health care in your portfolio, consider some. Now, if you buy Prime Cap Odyssey Growth, of course, you get 25, 30 percent in health care. So you will have health care in diversified portfolios, but if you want to specialize. Uh, unleashing the Second American Century. Uh, how many of you read this when it was in the journal? Nobody reads my column. Anyway, uh, it's the only book review I ever get to a journal. And the guy is named uh, Joel Kurtzman. He uh, was a senior fellow at the Milken Institute. He once edited the Harvard Law Review. He's got pretty good credentials. And he himself says that 10 years ago, he was pretty negative on the U.S. He is, he's like a cheerleader. I am optimistic about the U.S., but he is far more optimistic than even I am. Number four reasons. Number one, nowhere in the world, he says, you have the creativity in the United States. Nowhere will you get a Tesla. By the way, Elon Musk is from South Africa. He's an immigrant on the Tesla. And the SpaceX uh, private uh, in the space program, he's also in charge of it. Uh, nowhere do you get that. Nowhere are you going to have an Apple iPhone and Facebook and Tesla invented. So he says the creativity in the United States is just, and the conditions for creating in the United States with the venture capital and everything else is great. Nowhere else in the world. Number two, the energy reserves. We're going to pass up Saudi Arabia by 2020. We've already passed up Russia. If you take all the proven energy reserves, we know it's there. It's a matter of getting to it. And you take Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. put together. North America, we have twice as much energy reserves as the whole Middle East. It's just that theirs is sitting on top of it and it's much easier to get to. So this energy thing is a game changer. And this is why U.S. manufacturing is coming back. And if you look on, on the next page, the third one, excuse me, on the bottom, uh, the incredible, number three is down here on page 11, the incredible pool of unspent capital. He claims that $5 million on U.S. corporations. He wrote the book at the beginning of 2014. So uh, no, never has corporate America been so wealthy. They've been able to refinance their debts, Apple borrowed money to pay a huge dividend, even though it had plenty of money at, at a one in five weeks percent for seven years uh, back uh, uh, last year. Uh, he, and he says the high profit margins. Anyway, and... Uh, 
So he just he just thinks that, uh, and generally the corporations in America, and, and I think what also happened, they spent all this money on computers in the 90s, the early part of the century, and they really did learn how to use their computers and their data, and then they went to just-in-time inventory, and they have learned uh, productivity. In fact, there's a recent productivity study, and this is hard to believe, but the recent productivity study says that if you take U.S. productivity and compare it to Chinese productivity and adjust wages for productivity, U.S. manufacturing is only 4% more expensive than Chinese manufacturing and much, much cheaper than uh, Germany. And In fact, I'm back at page four at the top. Uh, he says, our manufacturing depth is incredible. And he quotes some statistics down here in the third paragraph. He says, in 2010, the average American produced $102,903 in value each year. France was 81, Germany 78, Japan 68. And he says that uh, we do the best job of getting the most of our workers. And one of the re things that hurt Europe, France. France got a socialist government, so they passed the law of workers. Seven hour workday, nine three hour workday, seven hour workday. And everybody in France must have, by mandate, 30 days vacation year. Uh, and if you work them at night or weekends, you got to pay huge, huge bonuses. So, anyway, the whole point is that uh, the U.S. Is, is number one, and rightly so. And he, and boy, I agree with this 100%. He says the two biggest problems in the U.S does not come from the private sector, does not come from productivity wages, it's two. One is our public schools. If you look at our universities and our community college system, hands down, number one in the world. People come from all the world to come to our universities. But if you look at our public school systems, what are our kids right? 28th in math, I mean, any world test. Uh, so his argument is uh, one in five Americans don't finish high school on average. What's a high school drop out going to be? I just saw a statistic where two thirds of the prisoners in North Carolina jails and prisons are high school dropouts. Two thirds. You're five times more likely to live in poverty if you drop out of high school than if you graduate from high school. And then finally, the tech re uh, uh, revolution. Uh, Apple reported great earnings. It's now at an all-time high. Uh, it's but a, it's a safe stock, relatively safe. In fact. Uh, this month, when all the other stocks were jumping around, it, it stayed between 96 and 100, 101, and then the reported earnings went to um, 104. It's at its all-time high, but it increased its 42.1 billion compared to a year ago in, in earnings. Uh, I mean revenue, uh, eight and a half billion and a quarter. It's making 34 billion dollars a year profit. It's got uh, over $100 billion sitting in cash outside the United States that it can't bring home because our stupid Congress says that if you do bring it home, we're going to take 35% of it. And Tim Cook says, I can't do that to my shareholders. I'm not about to bring home that much more overseas and have, I have the government paid 35%. And when they crucified him and, and for testifying in Congress in the spring, he, he said, look, we paid 31% taxes on the money we made in the United States. Every dollar we made in the United States, we paid 31 percent taxes. We paid more taxes than any other corporation in America, and yet you're telling me uh, that uh, I shouldn't keep money overseas. And of course, he was keeping it in Ireland in a tax uh, dodge, in a sense, but it was legal. I mean, and the Irish are going to change that law where he could keep it overseas and not pay any taxes on it. Um, anyway, if you want a safe stock and a good dividend, 4.6 percent dividend has done nothing this year. Uh, Verizon. Why do I choose Verizon? Uh, generally, Verizon has the best reception of any uh, phone company. And uh, expert, so-called expert, said on CNBC that if you're going to buy an Apple iPhone, Verizon has the best brand. How many of you have Verizon? Okay. Well, yeah, probably the majority. Stock has done, you know, hasn't moved up like others, but it's yielding four and a half percent. I think that dividend is safe, and I'd much rather have Verizon at four and a half percent than Duke at four percent. Although Duke is safer, there's no question. And finally, there's a recommendation from Mutual Fund Observer and Morningstar. And most of you know uh, that if you don't want to do this yourself or you have some friends that don't want to do it yourself, we'll manage money and we'll do it for 50000 I got a friend here named Chris. Chris, you want to tell him about your book? Oh. Thank you. Thank you.
financial record book, right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah basically wrote this for my wife. It's uh, so you can compile all financial information, uh, account numbers, passwords, uh, all your assets, uh, create a hard copy. And so it's a collection of tables, it's 85 pages. Uh, yeah, you spell it in. No computer, you actually write it in. It's been sitting on my desk to do because my wife would have no idea how to access any of my our investment accounts. $15? $15, yeah. yeah. And Dr. Hunger and I did nothing. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, I got time for questions. Fire away. I rushed through because a certain son of mine took so much of my time. Go ahead. Can you comment quickly on Ford and IBM? I sold both of them. Uh, IBM was very difficult. I love IBM, but I was trying to find money to buy airlines. <laughs> and, and I sold it before it went down. Got lucky. Steve and I both going to buy it back. It could go 160. I mean, what is it now? 163? Uh, it's gotten killed uh, because it missed, you know, has a hit its earnings and not a hit its projection. IBM and it earns, it's in 150 countries and it earns money overseas and the, the strong dollars hurt it. IBM, McDonald's, um, Coca-Cola have all been really hit hard. Uh, but I think at this price it's probably a good buy. Do you know what it is, Steve? 162. 162, well. I'm probably going to I'm probably going to take some profits from my airlines and buy it back this week. I think airlines got another week to go up. Uh, so, but yeah, it's been a terrible investment. You stole my thunder, but do you think that Congress will do anything about the corporate tax no. in, in, in the near future? Uh, I don't think so. There's a chance. Uh, you can't do it in an election year because of lobbyists. So it's it's either got to be 2015 or 2017. And the, the part is the liberal Democrats generally agree the corporate income tax isn't working, and certainly the Tea Party and the conservative Republicans agree it's not working, but it's just that the, you know, whatever is suggested, and then the lobbyists are so strong, what happens in the tax is you get a 35% rate, but then you help lawyers spend millions and millions of dollars to hire the best lawyers you can, so the average corporation pays about 11 or 12% taxes. It's all a game. But the problem is you can't do that with the money you bring home from overseas. And uh, um, Google, for example, uh, runs most of its earnings through Bermuda, and Bermuda has no corporate income tax. So it pays, I think, I read recently, Google paid 3% taxes on corporate income. It's a mess. It is worse than, our, and I say this, I wrote a column on it in the journal a year ago. It is worse than our income tax. So you think, if they can't do the corporate tax where there's general agreement that this is a disaster, what will they ever do with the income tax? And the answer is probably nothing. And that's why I think conversions are a good deal because uh, I don't see income taxes ever going lower, but conceivably in the future they could go higher. So anyway, questions? Probably no change. Uh, yes? Thank you. The Bill Gross move. Uh, Bill Gross, the Mutual Fund Observer guy, was at the Morningstar Conference, a professor from Illinois, and Bill Gross gave a, a uh, speech, and he literally concluded Bill Gross was losing his mind. Uh, <laughs> and obviously, he founded the firm, and he was he confessed to Jeff Dunlap in a, in a conversation with John Dunlap that he was going to get fired, and so he moved to Janice. Uh, before he get fired, but uh, I would not touch. Uh, I mean, he's been a brilliant guy over the years, but some people lose it when they get older, and he turned 70 this year. Right? <laughs> 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 anyway, listen, you've been a great audience. You've asked more questions than probably than any other audience we've had. Uh, don't hesitate to take us up. We've got our email. We've got our telephone number. We love doing free advice over the phone and by email. If you do want to come in and see me, I was charging $100.92 when I started in this business with John Wood for meetings. I lowered it to 75 when the market crashed and never got around to bring it back up. And I enjoy meeting with people and, and uh, it's, uh, we're so blessed that we're up to uh, right at $500 uh, million dollars under management. So uh, I'm going to pay far more than I deserve now. So if I could waste some free services, it's just a way of paying it back. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you.